Hi, everyone. My guest today is master negotiator and conflict resolution expert, William Urey. He has taught about conflict. He has negotiated many conflicts between huge companies and even in war-torn countries. And he is an expert in not only giving people the opportunity to resolve their conflicts, but very actionable tools that you and I right now today can use to resolve conflicts because that's what we're doing everywhere, right? We're in relationships, being in conflict is a part of life and how do we resolve them? Whether it's with a partner, someone we work with, a friend, a child, our family, whatever that is, William makes it really clear, really simple and very, very effective. His latest is, book is out right now and it's called Possible and it's how to survive and thrive during a time of conflict. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with William Urey. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Gabby Ree Show. William, I have to say that when I when I uh, read all your stuff and, and watched you, I thought only someone that kind of kind and peaceful is interested in negotiating. I think it's a, it, it seems like it would be the best personality to help people figure out how to are we saying the word compromise or are we saying the word negotiate? I don't know. Like what, you know what I mean? Like if you get a high yeah. powered alpha and they go, well, I'm not compromising. So tell me how you even got in this line of work. Well, it began when I was a boy and uh, we moved, my family moved to Europe for a few years and I was young and, and it wasn't that long after, you know, it was a different Europe than the Europe you go to today. It was still recovering from world war two and, and, Oh, it was like, it was, the, you know, there were, still, there were buildings in ruins and you could kind of feel the devastating impact of these two giant world wars. And, uh, and, and then there was the expectation back in those days that there might be a third world war. And the, even the school had a little nuclear bomb shelter with the, you know, big steel blast doors. And, and, uh, and I just got to thinking, there's got to be a better way than this, a better way to deal with our differences and blowing the whole world to smithereens. So, so that, that idea got implanted early and then, you know, stayed with me. And so I decided really to devote my life to, you know, that one question, which is how can we deal with our differences at all levels? And I noticed that, you know, even family, you know, dinner, you know, family dinners, quarrels and stuff like that. So it's everywhere from the macro to the micro and, and, uh, and I just thought there's got to be better ways of dealing with it. And so that's, uh, then that's, that's why I became an anthropologist. You know, I thought, okay, anthropology is the study of human beings. We're kind of a strange species. Why do we have this bent for self-destruction? And so I thought I'd understand that. And, but I really wanted to get, apply it to something very real. So that's how I got into the field of negotiation was get my hands dirty and get into the thick of it and see what it's all about. I feel like there's universal principles when you talk about negotiating, right? Like you, you know, you've discussed it and certainly in certain cultures, maybe there's kind of different nuance and protocol, but there's kind of these universal pillars of negotiating. And, and if it's different for personal dynamics, because, you know, a lot of times I think when it comes to work, um, for like for me personally, I feel like there's certain things I can lean into, like when they talk about leaning into. And with my family, I actually find the opposite. I, I'm I'm not leaning in. I'm I'm kind of holding space and and actually almost leaning back. I don't yeah. know. And because I'm not objective, and maybe ultimately there's a lot more on the line with our family. Yeah, and it's, it's true, you know, and it's intangible where maybe when you're negotiating in a business environment like you have and you've helped people resolve things, there's sort of some very specific marks that you're hitting and it's really tangible. And 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 even there, I know you encourage people to to take different positions, but maybe you could just share because you have so much experience. What are some of the universal kind of principles when you are trying to enter into a negotiation with a person, whether it's personally or in business? Well, the first thing I find actually has nothing to do with the other person is to do with ourselves. And you just were alluding to it. I find the same thing. I could be dealing with big world negotiations and I come home and, you know, the stakes uh, feel more personal. And so I find that actually 
Interesting enough, the biggest obstacle to me getting what I want, whether in a negotiation, is not the difficult person that I'm dealing with, you know, be it personal or professional or whatever. It's actually right here. It's me. <laughs> it's it's the person I look at in the mirror every morning. It's it's our own human, very human, very natural, very understandable tendency to react, which is to act out of fear, act out of anger, which gets triggered often when we get into conflict. And as the old saying goes, when you're angry, you'll make the best speech you will ever regret. You know, you'll send the best email you'll ever regret. And uh, and so we're we're our own biggest obstacle. It's, it turns out negotiation is an inside job uh, and we're our own instrument, you know? And so the first thing I would say is, I like to use this metaphor of like what I see successful negotiators doing is they go to the balcony. It's almost like you, 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 you sort of, you sort of like you're negotiating on a stage with other people and so on. And then you, part of you goes to a mental and emotional balcony where you can kind of like see that you, you can keep your eyes on the prize. What's really important here. I mean, is it, you know, you know, as they say in marriage, you know, you can be right or you can be happy, but you can't be both. And uh, what's really important here. And uh, and what's the big picture? And that's a place of calm. It's a place of perspective. It's a place we all know, right? So we all, we have, we have our favorite ways of going to the balcony. One of mine is to go for a walk. What, what, what do you like to do to go to the balcony? You know, I, I by nature have a pretty analytical personality. Yeah. And so I, I can do it. I can just kind of shift gears and just kind of walk, like watch what's happening. Because I, I think we all have... And you talk a lot this about this a lot where, you know, we have different reactions. Like you say, sometimes people retreat, sometimes they try to accommodate, like you, they have these different things. And I find that the minute I feel more aggressive emotionally, that that means I'm, I'm afraid, right? I, right. I I've learned that's a good to, insight. Yeah. I've learned to, it, it wouldn't be that obvious. You think, oh, that's, that's uh, being, you know, assertive or whatever. It's not, it's still connected to my fear. I just learned whether it's the way I grew up or through sports or whatever. It's like, oh, I'm, this is making me uncomfortable. I'm going to go at it. And the minute that that, and I'm old enough now, obviously that it, it's shown up enough that I go, oh, what's going on. So there it's just to get that 30,000 foot view right away. I just go, all right, get out of yourself, you know, that that internal balcony, I really appreciated that idea because it's such a better place to start. It is the best place to start is to stop. <laughs> and it's, it's like to disengage for just a moment because, and then you can actually, at least for me, I can kind of observe myself and like, Oh, just like you're saying, Oh, that's fear. You know, behind the feeling of aggression is actually fear. There's fear. Okay. And if you listen to the fear and you identify the fear, actually what happens is you start to relax a little bit because it's, it's seen. It's like you, you, you name the game, you name the inner game. And, and, and then you're suddenly, you know, it's important to have emotions and read your emotions. Your emotions give you really important intelligence, but what's critical is not to be controlled by your emotions. You want to kind of be, you want to be able to watch them, listen to them, witness them, and then, you know, take whatever information they have to bring you about what's upsetting you, what's what's really going on for you. And then, then you can proceed to deal much more effectively with the other side. If we can influence ourselves, we're going to be much better off in influencing the other. I think what you said, though, about taking a walk is probably the, it's the number one. If you read m multiple books about um, even getting ideas or creating space, it's, it's taking a walk. You, you know, walking, uh, I'm an anthropologist, as I mentioned, by training, walking is what made us human. I mean, we walked. I mean, you know, we're only sedentary here for, for a little percent of our time. I mean, basically, I mean, if you look, I mean, humans, 99% of our time, we evolved as walkers. You know, we, we even have large brains because we got bipedal, we walked and stuff. And walking, you know, what's interesting about walking, too, is Whoever fights while they walk, you know, no, no one ever fights while they walk, because if you're walking with someone, you're walking side by side, you know, you know, if, if I were close to someone as close to I am when I'm shoulder to shoulder with someone, you know, they feel physically uncomfortable. I'd be in their space, but shoulder to shoulder, side by side, we're in the same space and our 
eyes are looking out at the horizon. We can see the larger picture. We have that kind of that balcony, that prefrontal cortex kind of getting activated. And, and we get more creative. Um, I mean, what I love to walk is because, and I walk every day, you know, I, I, I live near the mountains. I love to hike up the mountains and, uh, and I like to take my meetings walking because they're just so much more productive and conversations when you walk, walk talks. Those are, those are great. Those are great. So you, you talk about the balcony and then you, you sort you have other principles and tools that you give to people. You know, I find it interesting that you started your books with kind of how to get to yes and how to get to no positively. And you really landed though on how to get to yes with yourself. So it feels like through your own work, you go, oh, wait a second. We still have to actually deal with the first part, which is us. So that felt like your learning curve. About- it is my learning curve. It's exactly it. <laughs> you know, I always write books about the things I want to learn. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. You think you write books about the things you know, but you, but for me, actually, I like, you know, it might take me five years, but I'd like to, I like to pick a subject that, okay, that's my learning edge. And you're absolutely right. What I learned is, wow, if you can't get to yes with yourself, no wonder you're having trouble getting to yes with others. <laughs> You know, if you can't, I mean, you know, like listening, which is, you know, one of the most fundamental skills, you know, that like in anything is to be able to listen. Now, why don't we listen? I think one of the main obstacles is we haven't listened to ourselves. And because we haven't listened to ourselves, you haven't, you know, like you were just saying, when you go to the balcony, you listen to your fear, you listen to it, you've listened to it. And then you've got more space, more spaciousness, as you were saying, to be able to listen to the other. And so the key, the trick to listening is actually listen to yourself and then create the space. Then you can listen to the other. Yeah, that makes sense. It would be like if I was crying, a baby is crying. It's like, how do I take any other information in until I feel kind of that space and that calmness? And and adults, we're so funny. We're, I think we think that we have it figured out or we we you know, because we mask it, it's not there. But I, I think what you're saying is important in, in, almost, in an everyday practice. These are everyday practices. And I mean, the, the good thing is we can get better at it. You know, we can get into the, like, what would it mean to be get into the negotiation Olympics? You know, it's through continual improvement. And the, the good news is we get a chance to practice every day. <laughs> we got conflicts, we got to negotiate. I mean, how often do you, I mean, if you, you know, I ask people, um, you know, who do you negotiate with? Just if I really to define negotiation broadly as, you know, back and forth communication, you're trying to reach agreement. And I was, well, I negotiate with my kids, I negotiate with my spouse, I negotiate with my business partner, I negotiate with the customers, I negotiate with everyone, I negotiate with myself. And then I say, well, how much time do you think you spend negotiating in that broad sense of the, the term? And I don't know, what would you say? How much time do you think you spend communicating back and forth with someone close to you or whatever? What would you say? I mean, if you're not including myself inside, I I'm, think it's, I'm, I'm, oh, well, then that's, it's. Include it, yourself. Yeah, it's 90% of the day is, yeah. you know, you're, why would I think that thought? Why would I have that reaction? Okay, I have three daughters. It's like, okay, what does she really need, and why do I, why am I reluctant to give that to her? What what does that really represent? Um, and you 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 have a daughter, so you understand what I find fascinating yeah. about daughter. My daughter is named Gabby. <laughs> yeah, is that and she she can plank for a long time. I like that. Is I uh, I realize that they really are the great teachers because they call me on the real thing I'm reacting to. They go, you're saying no because of this, not because of that. And I'm like, you are a hundred percent right. Right. So it's my values clashing with their values. The perception is that going to be perceived as bad parenting, whatever the million weird reasons are. Um, so before we, we go to the second, uh, place, which I, I really appreciate the bridge. I just want to remind people that you, you remind people that just because it looks different, we all kind of respond. I said that I, I can sort of lean in and attack. You say people will avoid or accommodate and, and none of these are actually the best strategies. That's exactly right. We fall into what I call the three, a trap attack, avoid or accommodate. And sometimes we do all three, you know, we, we, we might, uh, we might accommodate and then we avoid for a while and then we'd lose it and we go on the attack and then we go around like a little rat in the maze. 
And, uh, and the question is, what's the way out? And the way out, I find, is paradoxically, it's to kind of lean into the situation with curiosity. I mean, when you start talking about leaning in, you might be slightly detached, but you're, you're kind of like, like you, you're curious about it. You bring curiosity and then you embrace it. I mean, a conflict, we don't think of conflict as something you should embrace, but you know, kind of put your arms around it in some sense. And, and you don't have to end it because it may be creative tension. I mean, conflict is something natural. It's part of life. You don't have to like stigmatize it, but just transform it. Just change the form from, you know, we have a choice. We can either handle the conflict destructively or we can handle it constructively and you know, choose door, door number B. As somebody, because you do have a family, I just wonder, and they obviously know you have all these skills. Because I have a lot of really smart friends and I've gotten guidance from people. And when they talk about this curiosity is in a way, I'm just curious, like in the most human level, um, how do we do that where it doesn't also seem antagonizing? Do, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, oh, it's right. like, hey, I'm engaged. Not like, oh, this is fascinating. You know, it's like, where's the sweet spot for, I don't want to react, but I, 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 I care deeply. I'm involved. I do need to take a little space so I can try to, you know, come from that place of going towards resolution, not towards, you know, I want to be right or I want to win or you need to be wrong. But in there's a moment, right, where someone's they are looking at curiosity and I'm, I'm always, cur I'm always fascinated. Is there any kind of skill to doing that where it doesn't seem like you're being antagonistic? I think a lot of it actually, um, a lot of negotiation boils down to respect. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I always like to think, you know, respect is the cheapest concession you can make. And how can you respectfully be curious <laughs> is the question. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and, you know, curiosity is kind of noticing and you might notice it's not the right time for the person. You know, that's, you know, I, I know, I, I, you know, our, our daughters are our biggest teachers. My daughter certainly is. And, uh, and sometimes I realize I ask her questions and she could take it as an intrusion, right? Uh, like it's intrusive and, and I'm being curious, but, but so, yeah. So one is just notice. Is she, if I can catch myself, does she want to be have a question right now? And maybe is a question the best way to be curious? It might be just like you were doing right now. You were saying, you know, you were talking about yourself first. You say, well, you know, I'm feeling and I'm a little this and I'm a little that. So, so you're talking about your own feelings first. You're not like asking about their feelings, you know, you, but, but, but you're bringing it to a different level. And then, then you can kind of like, you know, and right now I'm feeling like, you know, I'd like to know a little more about you, but maybe this is not a good time or whatever it is. You just kind of like gently get yourself into the conversation. So curious, that, I mean, there, there are kind of like sometimes, you know, we have a tendency to go directly to the point, <laughs> directly to the point. And negotiation is a little bit like sailing. I don't know if you sail, but sometimes you tack a little bit. You don't go straight at the point. And I, I think that's it. I, th I guess the reason I want to bring up this nuance is because I think we can be honest and genuinely intended, but still also the art of communication and rhythm. Like you said, if you're dealing with somebody who's highly upset or it's a very sensitive issue, it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm still being honest and I'm, and I still want to get to the solution, but I'm willing to just sort of, you know, move in the rhythm that also will work with them. It's not dishonest is my point. That's it. Uh, you want to kind of like, you know, match, you know, match someone you want to, kind of, it's almost like, uh, it's like tuning in. You want to tune in to where they are. Um, and, and, uh, and we all have actually this internal capability to tune into others. You know, we have these mirror neurons and so on. And just like our nervous system, is that, you know, you can even just like tune into yourself. Am I stressed? Is there some part of, you know, just to, your, our bodies are exquisite instruments for listening actually to, to ourselves, but also to the other and saying, you know, I feel something funny is going on here. You know, there's something going on, you know, I, I don't know what it is. And that's, in fact, now you can pick up if someone's lying to you. 
it's not by just looking at their words or whatever. You get this funny feeling in your gut, like something's off here. I'm not quite sure, but there's something that doesn't quite make sense or something incongruent. And so your body is, is, a, is an instrument. So you use your body to listen and tune in to where the other person is. If the other person's feeling stressed, uncomfortable, anxious, fearful, you're going to feel it too in your body. Yeah. I've learned, I, I learned through being in a, in a long relationship um, with a very, very direct person um, who also can handle like really uncomfortable, like no problem. You can say, I'm feeling this and it's like, oh, okay. You know, and you're like, really, you know, like, that's okay. I had to, I had, I have, and have had so much to learn about communication because I was always, well, stoic because that was a lack of willing to be vulnerable. Right. Like stoicism can slide over into, well, actually, I'm not going to show you my cards. Right. Right. Um, and I live with somebody who's the opposite. It's like, here's here's yeah. everything. And 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 with my daughters and what I've learned is even saying things like um, I can see your point where maybe it's a small little thing. And they they sort of say a truth that even might be uncomfortable instead of trying to defend it or whatever you go. I I can see that. And it's amazing how even just that small acknowledgement can really get you into the better rhythm of connecting and communicating um, and not being defensive. Um, that, that's absolutely it. It's like go to the balcony and then find a way to step to the other person's side. And what you're doing when you say just that little thing, you don't even have to agree with them. Just say, I see your point. You may not even agree with the point. Just I see your point. Let's them know that they're seen, they're heard. That's respect, really. Respect is, you know, comes from the Latin respect to see again, like spectacles and re, you know, it's to see again, to actually see the human being who's there. And uh, so much of this is really boils down to something that is so, it's, you know, I, I say it's the cheapest concession you can make in a negotiation. It costs you nothing, but it means everything to the other side to be seen, to be heard. You know, their dignity means everything to them. So, and that actually, when you say, I see your point, they feel seen and their system, their nervous system actually relaxes because they're, they're seen. They don't have to kind of be defensive because, oh, you see their point and you're on, you're on their side. You know, so much of negotiation is about, you know, we think, oh, I'm on one side and we're kind of in a tussle with the other. No, step to their side and then put the problem, whatever it is. On, on the other side of the table, and how do we jointly, you know, solve this problem and address it? Suddenly, it's very different. Uh, it's that, that shift from face to face to side by side. And you talk about a bridge. Can can we can we can we drill down a little bit sure. about the other kind of two positions that you really emphasize in negotiating? Just as the same with balcony, you do the opposite of reacting, which is you go to the balcony. Same thing was with the bridge, because our tendency when we when we get into conflict, we tend to think small. You know, we tend to like get small. We reduce everything to us versus them. It's kind of a, almost like a win-lose battle. Who's winning? You know, I feel on the defensive. And what often happens is people start to, they dig into their positions and they start pushing each other. And, and it becomes like a contest of wills. Who's stronger? And, and, uh, and you might get attacked. You might feel threatened or whatever it is. And it's almost like, your mind is right here. Their mind is way over there. And it's like there's a giant chasm, like the Grand Canyon in between you, which is filled with doubt, anxiety, fear, anger, resentment, you haul the baggage from the past, whatever it is, distrust. And, you know, our tendency is we're over here locked into our position. No, we've got to like leave our position for a moment. It doesn't mean giving up, it just means leaving it for a moment. Start the conversation from where they are. I see your point. You know, that was a good example. And then build them a bridge, a golden bridge, like the Golden Gate Bridge, which I grew up near, <laughs> you know, the, a golden bridge over that chasm. In other words, make it as easy as possible for them to move in the direction you want them to move. Because so often in conflict, we're make, we think we're making it, we want to make it harder for them. You actually want to make it easier for them, easier for them to make the decision we'd like them to make. Instead of pushing, you attract. That's the art of building a golden bridge. If someone's listening to this, they think, okay, I'd be willing to do that in my friendships and my with a partner, with a child, because these are my personal relationships. Now, if somebody's listening to this in a business situation, I think so much of 
I think that's real uh, more challenging for people. It's like, wait a second, I'm trying to make it easy for that person over there who's making it really difficult for me. And you deal with these, you know, extraordinarily successful people, alphas, you know, hard charging corporate business owners, all, you know, global, the whole nine yards. How do you, because sometimes the smartest people and the more successful they are, it's almost like, I would imagine it's almost harder to get them to do it because what they've done so far works pretty well. So they're like, you know, I know stuff, like, look at what I've built. How do you, how do you get them? Where do you get them to go? Oh, wait, that makes sense to me. I have a friend who's a hard charging business tycoon. A, I mean, he was a boxer, champion boxer, racer, aggressive, (laughs) <laughs> go get him. And that's how he built his, you know, his business empire up from scratch, you know, from a little bakery to, you know, Brazil's largest supermarket chain. And, uh, and he'd gotten into a fight, a big fight with the largest shareholder. He was a chair of the company and there's a largest shareholder. And it was, and for them fight, wasn't just a little ordinary fight. No, it's like a dozen lawsuits and, and, uh, and, you know, character assassination in the press. And I mean, and it was just driving the families crazy, too. It had gone on for like two and a half years. And the daughter, his daughter and his wife approached me and said, could you help? You know, because he's, he's that, that type you're just talking about. And so I said, I don't know if I can help it. But uh, uh, I went to see him, not in his office. See, that's one of the keys. Not in his office, at his home. And he had little kids. He had a second family. He had his little kids running around, his little son and daughter. And I asked him, uh, so we're, we're at home, so he's more comfortable. He's, not, he's outside, you know, not behind the big desk. And I said, Abilio, um, what do you, you know, what do you, what do you want? You know, that, that basic question, you're like, you know, curious. What do you, what do you want? And like a good businessman, he gave me, you know, like six things he wanted. He wanted a, a whole bunch of stock. He wanted the elimination of the three-year non-compete clause. He wanted the company headquarters. He wanted the company sports team. You know, it just, he had a whole list. And I said, I got that. I said, uh, but it be there, tell me something. What do you really want? <laughs> and he looked at me, what do you mean? I said, yeah, what do you really want? You, you're a man who seems to have everything. I mean, you've got a new family. You've got as much wealth as anyone could possibly want. You know, what do you want in your life? What, 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 what is it you really want here? Because you're involved in this big fight now for three years. Well, he looked at me for a long time. He was silent for a long time. And silence is golden, incidentally. It gives someone a chance to think. And finally, he said to me in Portuguese, he said, liberdade, which in English means freedom. Freedom. I want my freedom. And for him, I knew that had deep personal resonance because 20 years earlier, he'd been leaving his apartment and been kidnapped by a group of criminals and held in a coffin for a week, you know. And this is the guy A type in control and thinking he was gonna die. And only by a miracle was he kind of found by the police and released. But freedom really meant something. He felt, you know, like he was a hostage. And sometimes we feel hostage of these situations. And I said, So what does freedom mean to you? What do you want to do with your freedom? And he said, Well, my family means everything to me. And he pointed to his kids. I said, freedom to be with my family and, and freedom to make the deals that I love to make. And at that moment, you know, when he, the way he said the way freedom, I heard it just like, again, in your body, you just hear it like there's a little tone, like a, you know, like a little sound. And I knew I'd hit gold. You know, that's really what it was about. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about this and that, everything. That's what it seemed to be about. And interestingly enough, you know, I was helping him, in effect, go to the balcony, you know, and really see what the prize was there. And, you know, within three months, and in in the end, it only took five days. Once I knew it was freedom, then, you know, this conflict, which was supposed to go on for seven years, everyone thought was absolutely impossible. We were able to uh, resolve it. I sat down with a fellow who represented his partner in like five days. And we had both men signing an agreement, wishing each other well. And the most important thing was at the end of it, I asked uh, Abelio, I said, "Uh, did you get what you want? And he said, you know, I got everything I wanted. He said, but the most important thing is I got my life back. And and his wife said to me, you know, uh, his little son, who was only three, I think maybe three or four at the time, said, oh, Poppy's not always on the phone. And it's interesting how we really think, uh, 
you know, we want so, so many other things than what we really want. And I'm just curious, um, when you're dealing, let's say you're trying to help somebody, uh, the, what comes to top of mind is the fact that the other gentleman also had somebody helping him get to the balcony and the two of you could meet. So that's like a kind of a great case scenario, even though, I mean, imagine it's even like your pride. And if you're talking about uh, even culturally, right, like a little more machismo culture for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, well, they, I, I was humiliated. They disrespected me. Like you can really get over it. What what happens when you have, let's say the other gentleman was not compliant. You know, let's say there's people who no matter what, they're not going to they're not there yet. They're just not going right. to get there. But your guy is there. I'm, I'm just curious because. Yeah, maybe, well, that happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what, what What is it? What, what do you how do you help them when you're in a situation where only really one person might be willing to to take build bridges and to go to balconies and to do all these things yeah. but the other one isn't yeah. but because that's the other thing people get stuck and they lose their freedom it's like uh, any lawsuits it's a nightmare people think oh and they say things like it's not fair and it's not right and i'm like correct you want to get out of this as quickly as you can so because people stand on that right they do they do and they give up their lives for it yeah. So what do you have? Do you have a way that you reach somebody who you go, Hey, this person, they're, they're ripe to, to kind of do it different. And the other side just clearly isn't. How do you help them? Yeah. Well, that seemed to be the case in this, in this case. Um, and actually, if you'd talked to the other guy, he would have thought too, they both thought that the other was absolutely impossible. I mean, this guy, my, my client, once he said to me, he said, you know, you've been dealing with, I don't know, the Chechens and terrorists and stuff like that. That's nothing compared to the guy you're going to have to deal with now. <laughs> you know, that was his experience. And we often have that experience. Um, and it certainly seemed that way to everyone that these two guys, you know, neither of them was going to back down because a lot of it actually had to do with neither of them. Once a fight, neither of them could afford to be seen to be backing down. You know, you talk about the macho thing, you know, it just... And so it wasn't just freedom that he wanted. I realized it was dignity. You know, it's like, and so we had to figure out a way uh, to, in which no one could tell who won here. And in fact, both did actually well. And and I, I'm, uh, but, uh, but this was that kind of situation. And in fact, oftentimes it is those situations where you may want to get to yes, but the other side is extremely obdurate. And, and and that's why, I mean, I talk about the golden bridge is you got to figure out a way out. And it's not about, you know, when you, when, when I said making it easier, you're not making, you're, you're making it easier for the other side to make the decision you want them to make. <laughs> you, it's, it's not about making it easier for them. It's like making it easier for them to make the decision that you want them to make. So it's like clearing the obstacles because oftentimes there's a lot of obstacles like distrust. You know, why aren't they, you know, ask yourself, why aren't they, again, you go to the balcony, you, you put yourself in the other side's shoes for a moment. You know, even if it's your bitter enemy, you want to put yourself in their shoes. You got to get closer to your enemies than your friends sometimes because you got to know them. How, how can you possibly change someone's mind unless you know where their mind is right now? So you got to like put yourself in their shoes and and then think about why are they saying no? Why are they being difficult? What's really behind it? What's really going on there? You know, I mean, long ago, I remember reading about uh, um, Steven Spielberg when he was a boy uh, there in L.A. Uh, he was like 13. There was a bully in his class who was 15 who would just beat him up and made his life pure, absolute hell. And he would like run from run from home from school, dive under bed, call out safe to himself. And then one day he thinks, how do I get this bully off my back? You know, how, how do you deal with a bully? So he goes up to the bully one day. He says, you know, I'm making these little home movies. Even then he was making home movies. And I'm making one about fighting the Nazis. And I was wondering if you'd care to play the war hero. Well, the bully laughs in his face, but a couple of days later, grudgingly, he comes back and says, okay. And so young Spielberg takes him, dresses him up in fatigues and backpack the whole works and makes him the war hero in his movie. And guess what? Spielberg reported 
that bully became his best friend. His best friend in high school was his bully beating him up for an entire year. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves when we're dealing with these bullies in life is why does a bully bully? What's, what's the motivation? What, 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 why do you think a bully bullies? If you had to guess, what's well, there, what are the motivation? There, for me, I, 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 what comes to mind is there's something happening at home that they're bullied and they're probably really, really afraid. And God forbid, maybe you seem like they saw your mom drop you off one day at school and you seem like you come, you get some love that, you know, right. So Envy. I, I yeah. mean, it can be complex in so many ways. Yeah. And it often, you know, we think, you know, the aggression, as you were saying before, that aggression comes from a feeling of strength. It actually comes from a feeling of insecurity. Bu bullies generally feel insecure and they want attention. They want recognition. They want a sense of control. So what did Spielberg, he looked in his repertoire, what can I do to give this guy a sense of attention or control, make him the hero in my war movie? And that's how the bully shifted. And so that's what we need to do is because we, their bullies aren't just in high school, <laughs> they're in real life all the time. So you have to kind of step back, go to the balcony, and figure out what's the motivation, what's really going on there, and then see if there's some basic human need there that you can find some way to address that can flip the situation. I mean, I'm not saying it's always going to work, incidentally. This is the hardest work you can do. But you're always looking for possibilities, you know. Instead of seeing obstacles, just obstacles, and just saying, oh, this is impossible, you know, just stay with it and be curious, and you might see little possibilities, and one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Yeah, and I, I'll share, you know, personally, my husband and I have had um, different kind of frivolous lawsuits put against us, you know, for this or that. Mm -hmm. And um, I had one maybe a few years back, six six years back, and and um my lawyer called and was like, it's a shakedown. Like, I don't know what to tell you pretty much. You know, it was like mm -hmm. one of those kind of situations. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's hard, but my thought was, I, I really want to, and I had been through enough things to learn my lesson on this. It was like, what is the quickest way back into my own freedom or my own life? And if it's a dollar that I, I can, I'll survive. Uh, it, it, it's uncomfortable. It won't, it's not going to be fun to get rid of this person, but the cost to stay in my freedom and not get entangled. And that, and that's why I'm always very compassionate when people have divorces and especially things around children, you know, custody, because you can't do that, right? Like you just, you can't go, okay, here's a check or you get it all and I'm out and I'll right. start over. It's like, you're dealing with your kids or their safety, or maybe your part, the ex partner is really out. They want to, they want revenge, but I do want to encourage people to your point. It's, it's okay to let people win in, in that, in that frame of, yeah, yeah, you win because your time, your, your well being your peace of mind, you, even getting into a legal battle. It's a nightmare. They'll, the court will be like, okay, cool. We'll get back together in 16 weeks to have another meeting to then talk about what we're going to do in five more months. It's a nightmare. It's like, get out of it as quickly as you can, if you can. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you might think it's unfair. But one thing my husband taught me is he goes, you know, how's that working for them? It's like, we, we have to live by our code. People live by their code. They'll answer to whatever choices and decisions they're making. We don't have to be judge and jury. Like it's okay. <laughs> you know, uh, cause it's, people don't realize how hard it can be on you. That's true. That's absolutely true. Uh, you know, uh, it was Voltaire who once said, uh, I, I was ruined twice in my life. Once, when I lost a lawsuit and once when I won a lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, it's true. And that, that's the importance of going to the balcony and really thinking what is really important to me, you know, in this situation. And, you know, sometimes you do need to stand your ground. And of course you don't want to like attract other frivolous lawsuits and whatever. So you need to, you need, you need to balance it. And at the same time, we waste so much time in, in the battle to be right. <laughs> and, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, you know what they say, you know, you know, it's like, uh, it's 
Like, what is truly important here? Life goes by in a flash. What is going to be really important? And you, you know, you come to, you came to freedom. And, you know, you know, it's interesting. My friend who said freedom, you know, so that was, I saw him at his 85th birthday party, not too, you know, about a little while ago. And all he could talk about was in the last period of time, last 10 years or whatever, he was free. And that that was the most, that was the best years of his life. Now he, he, he could have sacrificed it on that, you know, lawsuits and battle, or he could have the freedom that he wanted. Yeah. yeah. And he could have had like a third wife in the next situation, right? Because it's right. like, you know, so you, you talk about the third side. I really appreciated this as a kind of a, a actionable part of the Brit, you know, of, of the balcony of the bridge. It's kind of like there's three dimensions in a negotiation. There's, there's, there's the side, your three sides, you know, first side is dealing with yourself, negotiating with yourself. And the second is negotiating with the other, negotiating with the other. And the third is the whole, you know, and what happens in negotiations and conflicts is we so often we get thinking small and we, 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 we reduce everything. There's just two sides, you know, it's us versus them. It's the husband versus the wife. It's the uh, union versus management. It's, uh, I don't know, you know, what, you know, one warring side against another. And what we forget is that in every situation, there's never just two sides. There's always a third side, which is the side of the whole, the surrounding whole. Could be the family, could be the workplace, could be the community, could be the country, could be the world, whatever it is. And there are people there who who care. Like in the case of uh, my friend Abilio, you know, his wife and his daughter were kind of like, they were affected by it. Everyone's affected by conflicts, you know? And they were third-siders who said, hey, and they asked me to come in, not just as a negotiator for him, but as a third side or someone who would take the side of the whole. And then I recruited a person who represented the other. And together, that community, those people around who care, that caring community, we constitute a kind of container, like a circle within which, like a like a, a, a you know, a pot of like you cook something, you cook the conflict, you know, you cook the you transform the conflict from its destructive form to a constructive form, you know, third siders can help calm the parties down, help them go to the balcony, help them build the bridge, help them listen, help them communicate, help them facilitate. It's not just neutrals. It could be mediators. That's a third sider too, but it's often just a friend. It's a colleague. It's someone who can, who can help you. And I found that in a lot of tough conflicts, we think we got to do it all ourselves. And in fact, there's a big resource around us, which is the people around us who are affected by the conflict and have a have an incentive in trying to help us find a way out. Yeah. And I feel like when they know you and they're intimate with enough information, they can really be such a such a great tool and so helpful. We all have blind spots, you know. We can you know, we all have blind spots. So having a good friend, you know, who can serve as your balcony, you know, someone who can you're, we're so engaged, we're so identified, we get triggered, we're, you know, we're, we're like all these emotions going, someone who can just help us just see the larger picture. Wait a minute, is this how you want to spend your life? The rest of your life is battling this lawsuit or, or do you want to live your life? I can't help but think as a female, I often wonder for women in business, because it's obviously different, especially if let's say you're in leadership roles. Um, if this is like a, a a different nuanced thing for them to deal with. Cause a lot of times, I mean, I'm, I'm six, three, so it's a little easier for me just even having physical size where let's say you're a badass woman, you grind it through the ranks, you're the boss, you're five, two, you're one twenty, and it's still getting your brain around. It's not giving up or giving in taking this attitude. It's not a lack of strength. You won't be taken less seriously. I, I think it's, but I could see where it, it's almost trickier if you're mm. in that position yeah. um, it, with, the, you know, kind of that specific framework where you think, oh, great, now I'm here and I'm, you know, I, I'm having to give in. So I, I just want to highlight that because I could see where that environment makes it a little kind of more just complicated. It is. Uh, no one likes to give in, really, um, and uh, or very few people do, I would say. And I'm not suggesting giving in. I'm suggesting 
focusing on what you want. It's not about getting mad. It's not about getting even. It's about getting what you want. And so in that situation, to think about what is it that I want? And of course, you know, women leader in a, in a kind of male formed workplace, you know, they're going to, you know, like, oh, you know, if I give in, am I going to be sending a signal of weakness and then other people will take advantage of me? You need to think about those things, of course. But the, what I find is that, um, you know, to be an effective negotiator means to try to advance your interests, get what you want, and and if the, and also help the other side get what they want because you're going to be in a relationship with them, you know, a business relationship or a personal relationship, whatever it is. But the, um, you know, if you're asking the question, you know, who's winning? You know, if you're asking the question, who's winning this marriage? Your marriage is in some difficulty. And, you know, and most of business is relationship. We're interdependent. You know, it's like, um, you know, we think it's a win-lose contest, but the truth is that win-lose contests usually often lead to lose-lose. Everybody loses in the end. Maybe one side loses a little more than the other, but everybody loses and, and the community loses. And so, you know, the, the great challenge these days is to find you know, in these difficult, really hard situations where there's asymmetries of power and there's all, all these emotions floating around, where do we find the 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 outcomes, the relationships that allow us to both move forward, both address at least most of what we want, you know, our our most basic interests, and and then and then the the, the surrounding organization, the team, the organization, the community, all benefit as well. Yeah, I just really appreciated and, you know, kind of wanted to make that deciphering point, you know, and you, you, uh, you said something really, I think that's so important, which is if we can transform our conflicts that you, it's a way that we can all contribute to transforming our world. And I, I think all of us want to contribute to making the world a better place, which it does feel very combative. And I, I just want to remind people, because even if we can do this practice within ourselves, um, we can we can do um, so much for our own community and our little bit, you know, for the world. That's it, Gabby. That's absolutely it. I mean, the thing is, start at home. <laughs> you know, re, you know, if everyone starts to transform the conflicts that are immediately around them, it's like a kind of expanding concentric circle, like throwing a pebble in a, in a, in a pond. It, it it ripples out, and and that's what really makes the difference. So. So no conflict is too small. And to, to, and it's like, it also, you transform your conflicts, you transform your life and you transform the lives of people around you. Because the truth is, there's probably no opportunity in the world we can't realize. There's no problem we can't solve. I don't, whatever the problem is in the world, these problems are all made by human beings. They can be resolved by human beings if we can work together. And the biggest obstacle in the way of us working together is this little thing called conflicts. So if we can transform the conflicts, we can realize the the opportunities that we want to realize in our lives. Well, that's it, you know, because it, it feels like it's we, we're moving in certain ways in the other direction. So is that, you know, you've written so many books, you've taught at, you know, the highest level, you know, institutions, um, you, you've negotiated yourself, you've sort of covered this space. What inspired you? What was what? was sitting on the table for you to still work on that you go, Oh, I'm going to do a book. Well, the book started actually with a hike <laughs> with a friend of mine, Jim Collins, who's an author too, of, you know, books like good to great. And, uh, he turned to me and he said, uh, on the way up on the mountain, he said, you know, these are turbulent times. Do you think you could, uh, uh, sum up everything you've learned <laughs> in one sentence? Uh, and he challenged me, he said, Darwin could, you know, in the origin of species, the theory of evolution in one sentence and, and, uh, that we could be of use to us in these times. And so I like challenges and I like simplicity. So I went away and on our next hike, I came up with, uh, with, uh, with, with a sentence and, and I thought about it. And then he said, now go write the book. Um, and, but the deeper thing is I'm also, uh, I just, uh, <laughs> I just, you know, in the last year, my my uh, I became a grandfather, and I have a new. I have a, there's a baby in the in, a, in the family. His name is Diego, and uh, and on the day he was born, um, I had a chance to cradle him in my arms for an hour, and I was just looking at this 
pure, innocent being full of potential. And I was asking myself, like, let's that generation, you know, of kids, like, 20 years from now, looking back at today, what would they wish, what would we, what would they wish we'd done? <laughs> and, uh, and I realized, uh, you know, he's my new boss. <laughs> that generation is my new boss. And so that, that's why I wrote the book was really um, to, because I honestly believe I've you know, spent decades now wandering around in the world's toughest conflicts from South Africa to the Cold War to the Middle East, all over the Middle East, walking all over the Middle East. And uh, and I've yet to see a conflict that I didn't think was possible to transform. Uh, and right now we've got lots of conflicts here in our country and in the world, and and they get reflected at the family dinner table and in the workplace. And and uh, and I I honestly believe that if we take, I'm sure anyone listening to your show right now is a possibilist because they wouldn't otherwise be listening to you because you're so clearly a possibilist and, you know, believing in human potential. It's just a question of taking that human potential that we have as our innate birthright, our innate curiosity, our innate creativity, our innate collaboration, our innate relational skills, and applying it to these uh, thorny disputes that kind of set us apart. And if we can do that, and then we can fashion the world the way we want it to be. So, and you know, the, the world that we want our children or our grandchildren to, to inherit. You talk about side by side versus face to face and even that dynamic, how it, that's so different. Now we're dealing with screens and, you know, uh, 15 second, 30 second clips, right? We're not dealing with nuance or eyeballs or, you know, breathing patterns. We're, we're, we're really in a very different dimension now with conflict. We've taken conflict into this sort of flat space, which it's really hard to. Very hard. So it's really hard. Yeah. So in, in sort of addressing this as, as the person who has a little more experience, but now working for this younger generation and trying to you know, leave something behind that maybe they can pick up and be useful and they can continue. What, mm -hmm. what was, um, how do you address that? How, how did you incorporate kind of where they're also yeah. it's now not the town square or the dinner table or even, you know, it's now it's global and it's on a phone and it's quick. It's um, it seems even like a much more dimensionally complicated way to have conflict. It is. If I was a Martian anthropologist right now, looking down and trying to understand human beings, I would say, wow, you've come up with the most amazing technologies here that can really advance things. And you're using it to <laughs> using it for you're using it to to sling arrows and <laughs> insult each other or um or get addicted to it or whatever you know it's like like you know they they, they you know we have this enormous we have these enormous opportunities these technologies they're tools and I think we're just learning I mean we're, uh, you know the you know everything like is is fairly new and right now we've got AI coming and I know you've been talking about AI uh, and. And the question is, okay, how can we make these tools serve us rather than us serve them? That's the real question. And for that, we have to go to the balcony. You know, we have to, we, we have to, it's that same ability to kind of step back for a moment and say, you know, because we get, we get trapped. And of course, I mean, the trouble with the, with these technologies too is, you know, we're on one side of the screen. On the other side of the screen are thousands of engineers who are, who are trying to figure out ways to addict us so that we pay attention, we get engaged, we pay attention to the ads or whatever it is. And so it's uh, it, it, we really need to reshape our technologies, our, our, the medium in which we communicate so that it actually can help us do things rather than... Uh, Bring us into fisticuffs. I, I think a lot of the the increase in in conflict right now in the world today that's increasing is because of the way we're communicating or not communicating. I should say through social media. I think your original point, why you probably ended up on getting to yes with yourself, is, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine. We we're talking about how dopamine drives so much of us physiologically, right? And I said, you know, it's interesting. If I contend with my ego. 
right? Like, don't waste my time and, you know, whatever weird thing I have. And I go, oh, check that out. That's your ego. Then it's almost like when I get into that practice of, of, of going to the balcony and watching myself, I then somehow my dopamine, I can kind of also put at bay. You know, it's like right. practicing with your ego, like, hey, I'm not going to react. I'm not going to get offended. I'm not going to show you how smart I am. I'm not going to be right. I think I could be wrong that that has also been a helpful exercise in me managing this tool that we're talking about reacting, responding, because again, it's just another opportunity to observe ourselves. Um, That's it. When you wrote, That's... when you wrote this book though, did something show up because you are contending with this dynamic that was so really different or is it really, it's these same principles, but now we're just practicing them also on different mediums. That's, I think that it's, it's that. Um, and I just want to say, a little humility goes a long way. <laughs> you know, you know, the, to be able to look at your own ego requires just a little bit of humility there, which, um, uh, you know, in this world, I mean, uh, you know, in dealing with conflicts, I, I like the word, I like the phrase humble audacity. You know, you want to be audacious, of course, in taking on big problems, but you've got to, you've got to balance <laughs> the audacity with as much humility and humility is allows us to both recognize our own egos, right. And recognize, Oh, wow. That's not necessarily in my interest, the way that that's going, but humility also allows us then to listen to the other and take in where the other is. Um, and humility is maybe, maybe we're not always right. You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe the other side, we have different perspectives. We have different ways of seeing things. So humility goes a long ways there. And, and I do think, the, these principles, which are human principles. I mean, right now we're in the we're in this emerging age of AI. Where, just speaking as my Martian anthropologist for a moment, everything is is changing and about to change big time. It's gonna it's affecting everything, but it's gonna affect even what it means to be human. Because pretty soon, you know, I mean, I just is really, you know, we're gonna have a lot of people are gonna link it. I mean, all kinds of. I was talking to a. A friend of my daughter's is saying, oh, yeah, I would put in one of those neural links in my brain and connect up with the Internet. And and so it's going to be a, it's a different world. And what it means is the more we have AI, the more we need to learn to be human, <laughs> to balance it out. You know, uh, the more high tech we go, as a friend of mine used to like to say, the more high touch we have to be. You know, we have to balance it out. Um, and. The principles in the book of like going to the balcony, that's profoundly human. It's like, okay, mindfulness, watch yourself, self-observation, self-awareness. We're going to need that even more so going forward because think, you know, you know, fasten your seatbelt. We're in for a wild ride here. The ability, you know, the success will come, you know, our kids, what are we teaching our kids? You know, teaching the kids to observe themselves and to be masters of themselves, to, that's self mastery is going to be the the key because otherwise you'll just be addicted you'll just be totally at the effect of whatever new technological device comes up comes up with and so that's the first victory the first victory is a victory with yourself mm -hmm. and then that allows you to then think about a victory with the other which is the golden bridge which is you know the art of reaching agreement but in the end we want a victory for the whole you know, for the for the benefit of the whole, for the family, for the organization, for the team, for the community, for the world. And that's where the third side comes in. So in a funny way, as an anthropologist studying kind of human beings, you know, we're going to go through maybe the most rapid um, shift in human evolution in the next 10, 20 years than we have in, I don't know, thousands or maybe tens of hundreds of thousands of years as we try to figure out how to relate to this new technology, but it requires us to be more human. That's the thing. The more technology, the more human we have to be. So William, in, in sort of closing this out, I just have to ask because um, I'm always curious. Um, you, you look very healthy to me. You have a lot of vitality. I always say there's matte people and shiny people and you're very shiny and, and um and yes, I, I get that you have certain practices that you, you know, your spirit, you 
you're, you have, you're fluid. You're, you're, you know, I think that practice too, people don't realize that. And you've said this a lot. Also, when you practice this a little bit, it does get easier. It, these are muscles that you flex. Sometimes you get that your gatekeeper gets a little stronger. You get that pause, things like that. But I am curious. I mean, you're, you're in a very natural environment right now. Um, if you know, you've been made your physical practice and how you eat and all of those things, is that also as conscious as kind of the way you move through the world and react? I try. I do. I, I, uh, um, I mean, the foundation of any life is health, right? <laughs> Without that. You, and so, you know, eating well in moderation, you know, I mean, the thing I do is I try to link whatever I want to be with what I, what gives also gives natural human pleasure. Um, and like, okay, food. So enjoy food, but enjoy it in moderation. But like walking, for example, which is my, Kind of, you know, I, I do some stretching and yoga and stuff like that, but it's my walking. It's not like I go out and say, oh, I'm going to be disciplined. I got to go for a walk. It's, it's just an, it's just like I want to go for a walk because you, I go for a walk. It's beauty. It's a diet of beauty and wonder and, and it's like creative ideas and it's a chance to just, you know, let go of stress. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll walk two, three, four times a day, whatever, however long, but it's, but it's, it's it's not something I just have to kind of like force myself to do. It just becomes an it's it's natural because it it feeds mind, body, spirit, and heart. And and so you want to look for those things that are natural to you that just keep you that that are um, things you want to do every day, um, not just things you you have to do. I mean that that's what I find. And the odd thing too about because I you know I don't really you know. I don't really like violence and stuff, but I spent a lot of time in war zones or I've spent a lot of time in, in, in places. Um, the interesting thing I've found is that if there's anything I worry about or I'm afraid about in the world, if I turn towards it, instead of resisting it, if I turn towards it and I move towards it, I get lighter. It's a funny thing. I've, I've noticed this, like, you know, I a long time ago I, I had a thought to create a long distance walking trail across the Middle East. And everyone thought, that's the craziest thing in the world. I mean, who's gonna walk in the Middle East? And it's all these things. But it's interesting. And I've gone there many times to walk, and it's kind of an old trail. It re retraces across like 10 different countries, the old path of of um, Abraham and his family, you know, as you know, four thousand years ago, and it's as it's remembered by people in the region. And uh and it's, you know, I told people it's a hundred year project, but when you go there and you walk there, you think you might be going into a place of incre incredible danger. But when you're walking there, people are so kind to you. <laughs> They're so hospitable to you. They're so surprised to see you. And the stress that we have about imagining this as kind of a danger relaxes. So I found that actually, if you go into, if you move into what you fear, your fear turns out not to be exactly what you thought it was. And, and maybe that also keeps me younger. I don't know. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Well, our mind plays some really funny tricks on us daily. It does. <laughs> so. It does. It, I mean, it, you know, what, what's amazing to me, I, I watch my mind and it's like, you know, I think it was Montaigne who said something like, like, you know, I've, I've had a, you know, you know, uh, like life's been full of, uh, you know, like a million bad things, 99% of which never happened. You know, they're all in your mind. When you, and I'm just curious, because most people don't get into these situations. Let's say you're, you're, you're into high stakes negotiation. I'm not talking about some rich guys who are got their egos going. We're talking about war and people's yeah. lives. And you, and you are going to, you know, sort of talk to the other side, let's say. Right, right. <sighs> Do you have anything that you think that you've developed, even if it's on a subconscious level, that it it is an, it has a neutralizing? I know we talked about that curiosity, but you you're going into a, a place that, yeah. yeah, you know, you're representing the bad guys, whatever that means. Is there anything in your subconscious that you've developed, or are you? Is it sort of like I'm just going to come as my full, whole, honest self? And maybe your humanity inside of you will will feel that. Is there is there some technique? Because these then that's the real high stakes situation. And be scary. 
It is scary. And, and it's the same, you know, it's the same, I mean, these same universal principles, but what I find is, uh, well, I mean, I'll just give you an example, maybe the best way is to tell you a story. Like, um, I found myself, I was working on the Syrian civil war some years ago. And, uh, and as part of it, I was interviewing people on all sides of the war and I was interviewing jihadists too, you know, people who were fighting and, and, uh, I was right on the board with my colleagues. I was right on the border of Turkey and Syria. And these guys were just coming, literally stepping across the border, a few miles across the border, out of a battle, you know, where they're leading a battle, like 2,000 men in a battle, to, to be interviewed, believe it or not, because they actually wanted their story out. And um, and with, we would spend like three hours with each one, take this long time. And, uh, and this guy, this guy showed up who was... Uh, you know, he had the beard. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the absolute stereotype of an, for an American of, you know, like bringing up images of 9-11 and everything. And so, so I could watch my mind, that stereotype. But I thought, okay, let's just, how do I, how do I, I'll just show up and, and just be curious, you know? And so I, so instead of like asking him, what does he think about the Syria and the situation? I said, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, this is all through translation. Of course, I said, what were you what were you doing when, how did you get involved in the war here? What were you doing? And he said, well, and this guy who was like the, you know, leader, commander of 2000 troops, men said, uh, well, I was in university. I said, okay, so what were you studying in university? He said, uh, I was studying poetry. And I said, poetry. And I was like, you know, that's what I was saying. And I said, uh, he said, yeah, I was studying poetry. I was, uh, I even won the national poetry prize. My uncle was a poet too. And, and I said, can I hear one of your poems? And he, he declaimed one of his poems. And, uh, and then, I, then I, I was just trying to think of what, what could, I said, you know, imagine, uh, um, uh, I, and I said, so how did you get involved? He said, well, he said, I got called in by the secret police and for one of the poems I'd written, which was taken as critical of the government. And, and I was tortured. And I said, well, you're tortured? And yeah, he said, I was tortured three times. And, then he told me, you know, that, you know, he, he started off nonviolent or whatever, but then he saw his friends being shot down around him and he decided, okay, I'll take up arms. And anyway, I, I asked him another question too, which is, I said, so what, it, you know, if you survive this, he says, I don't know if I'm going to survive, but I said, what would you like to do with your life? What, 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 what you know, what, you know, get at some of his dream. He said, well, I met this uh, young woman in Egypt and, and I fell in love with her and, you know, we'd love to get married and have children. <laughs> but he was just very humanizing, whatever, it was, you know, the whole thing. Uh, and then I asked him uh, uh, at the end, at the end of the CR interview, I said, is there any message you want us to bring back to people in the West? He said, yeah. He said, you know, when we show up on your TV screens and your whatever your screens, you know, you just see numbers, this number of people killed, that number of people killed. Just remember that each woman, child, man here, as a soul, just tell them we all have souls. So like I could see my preconceptions just drop, you know, and, and again, it was just bringing, bringing um, curiosity rather than just, you know, immediate stereotypes to the situation. And, and then he said something at the very end, he said, you know, let me tell you something. He said, uh, other people have come to talk to us. He said, he said, but you're the first ones who came and listened. <laughs> That makes me weepy, William. Mm, yeah, it's touching. Just to listen. It's That's the thing about this work, I can say, is, you know, whether you're working in your family or you're working out in the world, it's like... Uh, yeah. Um, behind every conflict, especially every these tough conflicts that we face that are really troublesome... You know, it's it's human beings, and they're broken human beings, they're hurt human beings, and you get down to that level, and and uh, and that's why, you know, we think, okay, well, no, that means that's going to be very different from what we do in our families. I want to tell you, it's it's not that different. It's the same, and we all have these tools. I mean, it just it's not a question of like 
getting something new. It's inside of us. It's just a question of recognizing it, remembering it and honing and developing it. If we can do that, this is our birthright. And, uh, um, there's nothing too difficult here. There's nothing, I, however impossible it looks. Um, it may take time. It's hard work. It's hard to do, but, uh, and that, that's where the hope lies for, for, for our future. Yeah. And, you know, I, I often say too, like, it isn't about being perfect, right? Like just cause I can exercise these and practice them. I do have people like I will, I have very, one very close friend that's actually Jen who's on here and my husband, if I really had an initial thing that I really wanted to say or do, but I didn't cause I chose to go to the balcony, I will confess to one of them how I really, my initial feeling was, cause it was, it's almost like an offload. Um, so I think that, within it, we can honor ourselves all along. You know, it, it makes that easier too. Cause yeah. you feel like you got to at least sort of say to some one person, you didn't blow your thing up, but you could be like, you know, this person sent me this email today and I, I wanted to say this, I didn't. And, I, and so I think it's also people realizing it's not becoming a robot. It's just making, you know, a, a different choice. Well, I, uh, is there any, in, in, in sort of wrapping this up, is there anything that um, surprised you in writing this book that you thought, oh, I now have a new pers- a, a new perspective go or I've reframed something that I thought was one way and now it's it's sort of different? I would say the thing that keeps surprising me is um is how all this human potential is actually inside of us. And it, it doesn't require experts. You don't need an expert. I mean, even, you know, like the story you just told about telling a friend, that person is a third sider. If you just look around, these things, um, this is the gift of our ancestors to us. I mean, the reason why we're still around as human beings is because you know, we evolved, to, we're naturally cooperative creatures. Of course, we get into conflicts too. But we have this immense ability to cooperate and to communicate if we just use it. It's inside of us. It's just about awakening a, a potential inside of us. Because sometimes, you know, people think, oh, you're an expert. You've been this. No, no forget the expertise. It's inside of each one of us. These things are... They're they're not easy, but they're simple. They're inside of us, and that's 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 really what just I come back to is it. It's every one of us can be a third sider. Every one of us can go to the balcony. Every one of us can build bridges. We can start right here, right now, because there's no shortage of practice opportunities, and that's the way, bit by bit, conflict by conflict, we can make the world the way we want it to be. And you know, not the not the kind of these third party conflicts, but these silly day-to-day conflicts that we all experience are within our family. I, I'm curious, um, as my final question, my, Laird, my husband always says, if I'm looking for a fight, all I have to do is go outside my door. I feel like the more that we practice this, we actually run into less hassles. In the, like it's this magical antenna that we are, right? And and I think that that is another interesting side component. Now there's going to be things that are out of our control, of course, but the other side of this is in the end, even if you want to make it about yourself, it does make your life so much easier um, because when you have these practices, I feel like you run into less hassles. That's without question. Of course, it just, I mean, you, you know, conflict is what, you know, especially destructive conflict is what creates stress in our lives. It creates, I mean, it probably creates cancers. It creates, I mean, it, it, you know, it eats at us. Uh, and so our ability to just kind of like deal with these things constructively, you don't have to avoid them. You don't have to suppress them. You just kind of engage with them, you, you know, and, uh, and bit by bit, yeah, you're going to make your life a lot easier and happier. And, uh, and you're right. If you go out looking for a fight, you're going to find a fight. If you go out radiating a little bit of inner peace <laughs> and look at kind of like, you know, you know, seeing, seeing the, seeing, you know, connecting, tuning into other people where they are, you know, you're going to, life's going to be a lot easier. It's, it's, 
it's all about, I mean, I know, I know your, your, your husband's a surfer. We've got to learn how to surf the waves that are out there. You know, there are a lot of waves. We can't choose the waves anymore so, so easily. There are a lot of waves coming our way. There's storms. But we can surf, you know, and, you know, <laughs> Laird surfs beautifully. And we can learn to surf beautifully. We, we can learn to ride the waves. And negotiating is a way of riding the waves of, of human emotion and human relationships. Well, I appreciate you and the work that you do because we can all use uh, not only the, the very concrete reminders, but the kind of encouragement that it is something that we can be in charge of. So thank you for, um, and I'm glad your, your, your uh, friend um, gave you that challenge. Write, yeah, definitely. To write, to write Jim. Another, yeah. write another book. Yeah, no, I think it's a good challenge for anyone, I would say, is like, think about, you know, because all of us have wisdom to pass on. See if you can just sum it up in one sentence, just as a kind of like to see if you can get it that, that simple. Yeah. <laughs> I, I recommend it. It's not, and that's the hardest thing to do, right? Take big ideas and make them simple. It is. It is. Thanks, William. Yes. Well, great. Thank you, Gabby. It's it's just a huge pleasure. And I really hope that your listeners can, can you know, I'm sure they're all possibilists. And it's just a question. I, I, I'm absolutely positive that you can, we can, uh, you know, with that, that, these kinds of possibilists, we can, we can begin to, to, uh, to transform our, our lives and our world. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you want to learn more, there is a ton of valuable information on my website. All you have to do is go to gabriellereese.com or head to the episode show notes to find a full breakdown with helpful links to studies, research, books, podcasts, and so much more. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and send them to at Gabby Reese on Instagram. And if you feel inspired, please subscribe. I'll see you next week.